This morning, we continue to look to the story of David and see how we might be anointed to impact our communities and our world. After David becomes king, he begins his reign by bringing the Ark of God to Jerusalem. Uh, this is 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinabab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all of their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. The, angered, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there because he reached out his hand to the ark, and he died there beside the ark of God. David was angry because the Lord had burst forth with an outburst upon Uzzah. So that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day. He said, how can the ark of the Lord come into my care? So David was unwilling to take the ark of the Lord into his care in the city of David. Instead, David took it to the house of Odom Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Odom Edom and the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Odom Edom and his household. Holy words for God's people. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? God, won't you draw us close to you? Won't you make us yours this morning? That as we come before you, as we come hearing your word, that you would encounter us here. That we would be transformed to live out your call in this world. God, grant us your wisdom, your patience, your mercy, and most of all, grant us your spirit that we would be guided by you, uh, you alone. Be present, O oh God, move in this place that we too would be moved and changed. Speak to us, we pray, less of me, more of you, none of me, all of you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 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 It is good to be with you this morning. When I was growing up, I was a really, really good student. I got some mixed faces. You don't believe me. Let me tell you, everybody says this, I know, but I was a great, great student. Here's, here's how. Listen, I had perfect grades. I had lots of friends. I was the president of all the clubs. I was captain of my sports team. My SAT scores were in the 1500s, and I missed two questions on the ACT. I succeeded because I knew from a very young age that I was going to go to Harvard. Spoiler alert, I did not go to Harvard. <laughs> In fact, I got three separate rejection letters from Harvard, and my life was a mess. I was in turmoil. I went to the Mich University of Michigan, lost and confused. I, I lost direction of my life, and I quickly entered into these years that I call testimony years. And if you're curious, I'll tell you about them later. At some point, fun and apathy turned into panic when I realized that I did not know what I wanted to do with my life. And that's the story of how I became an English major. 
So it's fall of 2005, and um, I'm struggling, and I, I get back to school for my third year, and I have this new plan, a renewed plan, a sense of commitment of bettering myself. I was going to study better, and I was going to focus better. I was going to figure out what I was going to do with my life better. And then Hurricane Katrina hit. And after that initial shock and devastation and the, of the destruction caused by the storm, I quickly thought to myself, this is going to be my call. <laughs> this is it. This is how I'm going to make a difference in the world, how I'm going to make a name for myself. And so I launched this student group. I launched this group where we would donate a meal on our meal plan. And all 45,000 students at the University of Michigan were going to do it together. The dining halls agreed. The financial office was on board. All the local partnerships that we had to set up were established. And we got to the day of the donation, and we started dreaming. <laughs> Imagine if all the students gave one meal, even after you cut out the cost for the food and the lights and electricity, we would still have raised over $200,000. When we counted, we got to 65. Not 1,000, not 100, just $65. Sometimes you Sometimes you have a plan. Sometimes you have a plan that works. Sometimes your plan was not meant to be. In our text this morning, we, we have David who has a plan. The long and bloody civil war is over. Saul is dead and David has become the new king, anointed by the leaders of all the tribes. But the years of conflict and war take its toll on the people and they're discouraged. They're not unified. And so David begins his reign, his rule, looking for an inspiring symbol that will unite the people. He starts by making Jerusalem the capital, Jerusalem the city that becomes the political center of the kingdom, not tied to one side or the other, this neutral city that he names as the center of his kingdom. And having established that, he turns his attention now to the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you remember, this Ark of the Covenant was this beautifully constructed reminder of God's presence with the people. It was received during the exodus from Egypt when God's chosen people were wandering in the wilderness and they turned to the ark to remember that their God had not forsaken them, that their God was journeying with them, that their God would still continue to lead them into the promised land. But at some point in their history, about 30 years before our text, the ark that symbol of God's presence is captured by the Philistines, the enemy of the people, and it sits at the house of a man named Abinadad where the Philistines desert it. They just leave it there. So David, David takes 30,000 of his warriors, and he not so gently asks Abinadad if he can have the ark back. And unsurprisingly, Abinadad says yes. And so they put the ark on this ox cart. And they bring out all the instruments, the tambourines, the cymbals, the castanets, and they begin to parade to Jerusalem, dancing before the Lord with all their might, dancing before the Lord until the ox trips. And Uzzah, one of the sons of Abinadad, he's walking alongside the Ark of the Covenant for a time like this, just in case it would fall. And when it does, he reaches up and puts his hands on the ark to steady it. And at that moment, the Lord strikes him dead, for Scripture tells us that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And so the parade is off. The instruments are silent, the feet are stilled, and God is angry. And David is angry. 
And David is afraid, and he leaves the Ark of the Covenant where it is and goes back home. What happened to David's plan? What happened to this idea that there would be a symbol to unify the people, to be a spiritual centering? What happened to David's plan? For one, the ark was never supposed to be carried on a cart, no less an ox cart. See, the the ark was constructed with these very detailed instructions, these laws even, that said the dimensions and the wood and the style, and not only that, the way you carry the ark is also detailed in that same exactness. You don't put an ark on the ox cart. The priests carry it on their back. And they can't even touch it either. You have to put poles through these rings of gold so that you can carry it together and you don't touch it. But I'm not sure that that's what God was angry about. You see, I don't think that the rules or following the rules was what made God so angry. In fact, if you look at Scripture, there are plenty of times where David blatantly, deliberately disobeys the laws and breaks the rules, and he comes out okay. Instead, I wonder, I wonder if God became angry because like Saul before him, David lost sight of God's heart. Remember back in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, David is anointed by God when the prophet Samuel went looking for the next king. And he went looking for the king that would have power, that would have strength, that would have stature. And one by one, as he was prepared to anoint, God says no. God says no until that one. The last one. The little one. The one that didn't fit any of the description, but the one to be anointed because the Lord looks on the heart. See, God and David were connected by the heart, united by the heart, but today, David runs in front of God. David tries to manipulate God. David takes the holy. He takes the sacred for his political advantage. He manipulates the ark for his reign, for his glory, for the advancement of his kingdom. I wonder how often we do this. How often we try to force God into our plans. See, day by day, we live our lives overwhelmed by all that life throws at us. War and conflict, injustices in our community, hunger and homelessness. And our relationships, they suffer. Our marriages fall apart, we lose jobs, we get passed up for promotions, we've been out of work for months, we battle depression, we wrestle with addictions, we face loneliness, hopelessness, we don't know where to turn, and we do what we are prone to do, is we make plans. And as we do so, as we make those plans, we're sure that God will bless it. We assume that God has already ordained it. We fit God into our plans and not the other way around. When will we stop? When will we stop and listen? When will we stop to pray? Hear me when I say this. The point I'm trying to make is not that we go slow for the sake of going slow. I'm not saying that we slow down so that we might be paralyzed into inaction. No, the question we need to ask is whether we are listening to God. Say Uzzah in our text, he takes it to the other extreme. While David tries to control God by fitting God into his own plans for glory, while he runs in front of God, ahead of God, not stopping to listen, Uzzah tries to control God by keeping God 
contained. He tries to control God by being so careful with God, by protecting God, by keeping God safe, that he literally contains God on top of an ox cart. When will we stop and listen? Are we listening for the voice of God? Do we move when the Spirit says to move, not when we want to move, not when it's convenient for us to move, not even when it's advantageous for us to move, but do we move when the Spirit says move? And do we stop when the Spirit says stop? After our text, David hears that this man, Obedenum, has the ark, and his family, his household is richly, greatly blessed because of the presence of the ark. And so David, he releases that anger. He releases that disappointment. He releases that fear. And he makes his way back to the ark. And again, they line up. And this time they put the ark where it's supposed to be, on the back of the priests. And they line up again with their instruments, ready to walk towards Jerusalem, singing and shouting, dancing and rejoicing, and they make it not six steps when they stop. When David stops the parade, when he halts the parade, when he halts any progress that they had just made and he sacrifices an ox. He slaughters the remnant, the reminder of plans of the past. He slaughters the reminder, the symbol of his plan, that first plan, the original plan, the failed plan, not God's plan, but he sacrifices the symbol of his plan. When will we stop and listen? I hope and I pray that we might be a people called to lead in the community, to bring change and transformation in our lives and our relationships and those around us, but we can't do it until we stop and listen. For I know that God is still at work that God is calling you and me, and God knows our hearts. But let your plans be aligned with God's plans, that it is God who leads us, not our ambitions, not our desires, not the things that we want, but for God, who has been faithful through the time of David and beyond to now, that that God would be faithful to us even today. That's my prayer for us. Let's go to God in prayer. And so God, would you open our ears that we may listen? Would you open our hearts that we might hear? That our hearts would be aligned to yours, that we might be intentional about listening for the ways that you call us that we would put you first and your plan, not our way, but your way, not our will, but yours. Move in us, oh God, stir in us and release in us your perfect timing that we'd be in tune with the ways that the Spirit leads us, that we would hear her voice, that we would feel her nudge, that we would feel the ways that you call. Make us bold, oh God. And even in that boldness, center us on you. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.